The Ben Heck Show is brought to you by Element 14, the electronic design community and online store built for engineers and hobbyists alike. Join now and browse the store at element14.com. This is my favorite show. I should move closer. Allison Josephine Harriet. Yes, Mom? Why are you sitting so close to the television? Because I'm watching Adventure Time. Could you at least back up to protect your eyes? No. Do it. If only there were a device to keep children from sitting too close to the television. I know. I'll call the Ben Heck Show. Their inventions are good. Amazing builds, exclusive mods, cutting edge ideas, electronics, engineering, and more. Every week on Element 14's The Ben Heck Show. Getting kids to sit far enough away from the television. Our first instinct was to use some sort of ultrasonic sensor. This would be a device where it emits a frequency of sound, the sound bounces off the kid sitting too close, and then it detects how long it takes for the sound to get back telling at the distance of the object. That seemed like a really good idea on paper, but we started to think about it a little bit. Okay, what is the frequency of that sound? It was around 40,000 hertz. Okay, that's fine. We can't hear 40,000 hertz, but we looked it up. Dogs can, and cats can hear up to like 85,000 hertz. So while this might work to keep your kids away from the TV, your animals meanwhile would be going crazy and you'd have to call a dog and cat whisperer to fix the problem and a ghost whisperer if your house was haunted. In which case, Jennifer Love Hewitt would come over, but that'd be fine. The alternative we thought of was to use an infrared sensor, basically to detect the temperature of an object in the room. Uh, room temperature, you know, even in the summer, is probably not gonna be that high. It's not gonna be anywhere close to the human body. So we can say, oh, the room is either empty or we detect a heat mass. It must be something, and if the heat is high enough, it takes up enough of the sensor's field of view. Oh, they're sitting too close to the television. So that's a way we can do it without using high frequency sounds. The infrared device we're going to use to detect heat uses an I squared C protocol. I squared C protocol is a two wire protocol which uses serial data and serial clock. So what we need to do with the microcontroller is start the transmission, tell the infrared device that we want to look at its memory location number two, which is the start of its heat mapping, and then we're going to request 32 bytes of data. The reason we have to request 32 bytes for 16 samples is because it's two bytes per sample because it's floating point. Although we really don't care, we're just gonna knock it off to you know 60 degrees or 70 degrees Fahrenheit, even though the samples are in Celsius. But there's a conversion we'll have to do. So we request 32 bytes, and then we clock in the 32 bytes, and then we combine them by oring them together and doing a bit shift, which gives us 16 total samples. Okay, so here's our sensor. If some heat comes into this side of its field of view, we'll see this data change. If some heat comes into this side of its field of view, we'll see this data change. So it can't really see the distance of an object, it just sees the overall temperature. But I believe that we'll be able to use that to figure out the distance of an object because if someone was standing far away, they would only take up a few cells in the center, but as they get closer, they'll take up more cells. So if we average all the samples together, we can detect the proximity of a warm body. Here is our infrared sensor. It's hooked up to the I squared C bus of this Arduino, always useful for prototyping. And we have a couple uh, pull-up resistors on it. Uh, you usually wanna have these on the I squared C bus just to make sure that the um, lines are in a known state. Uh, Sometimes I squared C devices will work without pull-up resistors, but sometimes they won't. So it's usually good to stick on a couple 10K pull-up resistors, just to be sure. This is getting a grid of 16 samples out in front of it. And I think this has an effective distance of about five feet. So that should be close enough to detect any kids that are in range. On the screen here, we have some data scrolling by. Um, we see some higher temperatures at the top and some lower temperatures at the bottom, that makes sense because heat rises and these are cold cement floors and it's like the second coldest day of the year here in Wisconsin. If I bring my hand in here, we should see the numbers start to change on the right. Yep, see how the 70s are on the right side? If I come in this side, we should see them change on the left. Yep, there's the 70s over on the left. I think we can come up with a better way to show this than just a bunch of numbers scrolling on the screen. All right, this is Felix, and he's working on a program to help us visualize the data coming off of the sensor. 
Okay, so it looks like you've got the sensor and an Arduino and mm -hmm. some temperatures on the screen. Can you explain how yep. this works? Well, basically, I'm um, taking the data from the Arduino and I'm getting the average values here. And mm -hmm. then I'm applying that to the color mapping on this grid here. Okay, so here goes my hand. Oh, there it is. We can go left and right and we can go up and down. So it's like the world's lowest resolution predator vision. And what we'll do for our program is we'll actually take an average and once enough of the squares get to a certain temperature, that's how we know something is too close to the television. So what I want to do is, you know, if something comes into the frame, see how the numbers all increase, basically the average increases. I want to detect a group of numbers going above, well, we're, not, we're never going to get 98.6 degrees. It'll probably more like 70 degrees will be a human. Uh, yeah, so what we're going to look for is an average. We'll get all those samples, we'll add them all together, and then we'll divide by 16, and that'll be our average. And if the average of all the samples goes above a certain threshold, which will be selectable with a knob on the final unit, that's when the alarm goes off. But for now, we'll just hook up a simple LED. So I read online that a good uh, rule of thumb is you should sit back from your TV at least the size of the TV. So I would say a 40-inch TV is very common these days. So let's use that as a baseline. Okay, I'm getting closer. Oh wait, I'm a kid. I want to watch Spongebob again. Oh, I went off. Pretty good. I'm about 53 inches. Okay. I just want to see how sensitive it is. Non-living things shouldn't set it off? Yep. I'm going to try a blowtorch. Okay, that definitely sets it off. So it turns out that a blowtorch is warmer than a human, in case you were wondering. The infrared sensor is quite small, so I thought it'd be cool to use an AT-Tiny to drive it. However, there isn't enough RAM in the AT-Tiny, at least this particular Tiny that I have, to the I2C library. So I'm going to have to use my other AVR development board that I made instead. It won't be as small, but I think it will be small enough. This will be a little device that you kind of nestle in with your electronic components on your television. So I think I'll make a 3D printed case to put it in and then assemble it all together. I've added a few more things. There's a potentiometer which gives you a range control basically at which point you'll cross the threshold and trigger it. And there's also a piezo with a really annoying beeping pitch. Hopefully that will annoy kids and send them running for the hills. Hopefully they don't enjoy it like, wee, this is fun! Now that we have this in breadboard form working, we'll miniaturize it and make it into a final result. Now it's time for a tech timeout. The infrared sensor from today's project uses the I2C bus, so I thought we should talk about it. I2C means inter-integrated circuit. That's why it's I2, inter-integrated. Um, it's a bus, so you can put a bunch of different devices on the same bus. Your master, in this case a microcontroller, has two lines, clock and data, and each one of the devices is connected to it. Well, want to get confused, you might ask? Well, no, it won't. Because each device has a device ID, which is a 7-bit number. And the last bit on there is the read-write bit. Now we're getting into the I2C commands themselves. And this is where it can be a little tricky. In the example of today's project, we need to request a bunch of memory from the device. So we do a start condition, and then we send the device ID so we know what device we're talking to. We want to read from it. And then we send it a byte, and this byte is the memory location we want to read from. In this case, memory position 2, which is the start of the infrared data. Then we do a stop condition. And the reason we do that is because we're setting up the I2C device to get ready to give us the data that we want. So we send it the memory location we want, but then we don't just immediately read it. We actually have to do a stop, then we have to come back, restart again, send the device ID again, and then we get in the data that we requested. It's important that you read the data sheets for your I2C device. It'll tell you the order in which the bytes will come out, the commands you can send. It's usually pretty well documented on most I2C devices. Get dev kits fast. Element 14, your dev kit HQ. I've taken the infrared sensor and I've removed its jack and carefully soldered some thin wires to it. Again, it's going to be ground, positive voltage, and serial data and serial clock. So it's going to go into the case here. And then we've also got these LEDs that we're going to use as flasher warnings. And they're going to go in these little holes right here. So 
So on the surface, it'll look like this. And then these four holes here are for the piezo. So my evil plan for how I'm gonna do this, I'd like the development board to go in all in one shot, just like that. And there's gonna be a hole in the back for the adjustment potentiometer. So I'm gonna try something here. It's not gonna win any beauty awards, but I think it may work. All right, so I put some hot glue on there and I'm gonna cram this in place. And that is going to make sure that the components are attached to our driver board in the correct position for going in the case. It's a little down and dirty, but it'll work. See? I'm gonna attach the piezo buzzer the same way. I'm gonna attach one of its pins directly to a ground, so it'll be fairly solid. And the other side I'll attach to one of our I.O. So we have our infrared sensor here nestled in between the crystal and the piezo. And then we have our two LEDs down here. Those need a little bit more adjustment, but basically, um, again, instead of having to measure all these parts and position it, I b basically measured the bare minimum and it worked out pretty good. It's all about <laughs> doing it quickly and it'll achieve the same result in the end. There's tons of these Xbox 360 charge and play cables laying around. I will use this for our USB power. So here's the end. So let's think about the end of an entertainment center. Coming back around into a piece of equipment, a little bit of slack. How about that long? And the USB cable can slide through the back and it will attach to this to give it power. The reason I chose USB power for this thing is because, well, there's USB plugs everywhere. You know, your TV is gonna have one, your cable box, and you don't need to use up a wall wart in your power outlet to power this thing. You just plug it into an available USB port someplace. We're not gonna hook up the data lines. We're only gonna use the positive five volts on the ground. Let's wire up the IR sensor. So these two wires here are power and ground. And let's see if I remember correctly, yes. This one is going to be ground and this one's going to be power. Yes, I remember that because they don't really seem like, they don't look like they'd be that if you look at the back of the IR connector, but they are. So my cheap trick I like to do with this wire is, well, you just heat up the end of it and it'll kind of strip itself. So I've got my positive five volt rail here on my dev board. Let's hook that guy up. Now we started with these wires way longer than they would have ever needed to be, but that's okay. Cause you can always cut a wire shorter. You can't make it longer. Well, you can't easily make it longer. Okay, then the last two wires here are the serial data and the serial clock for the I squared C. So I'm going to bring these up, cut them a little bit longer than they need to be, bring them back, then I'm going to separate them using my X-Acto knife. There we go. Okay. Separate them a little bit, then use the heat trick to recede them a little bit, like my hairline. That's more than a little bit receded. There we go. Happy little clouds. I'm gonna put some solder in these two spots. I'm amazed this ribbon cable doesn't have to flip, because usually when you, have, when you move a ribbon cable around, Murphy's Law always dictates that it must flip, but this one didn't, so that's... <laughs> I sound superstitious, but you'd be amazed how much that happens. It's definitely more than 50% of the time, even though it should be you know 50% of the time. Come on. There we go. Now, this would have been easier had I not put this potentiometer in already, but I needed to place the potentiometer in order to measure it for the case. So, you know, sometimes you have to put the cart before the horse. Let's make sure this all fits together before we go any further. Yeah, it goes in there. I gotta hook up the other side of the piezo to this wire here. There we go. Now I'm gonna wire it in a way that's most convenient for the space that we have. So I'm gonna take this guy right to this connection here. Make the wire as short and 
small as possible. There we go. I'm going to remount these LEDs. I want to make sure the polarity of the LED has a negative at the bottom. That way it lines up to the bottom rail of power on my board here. I also want to cut off any leads I don't need. That way it has less chance of short circuiting. It's not like it's going to short circuit and explode, but yeah. Don't want any shorts. I think what I'll do is I'll insulate most of these connections here so the LEDs don't short to them. And then I'll run the LEDs off of one of these extra connectors here. That way I have a room to put a resistor in line there. Actually two resistors. And uh, yeah, so it's, in this case it's more about um, the best place to put components rather than what pin to hook them up to. So the components dictate how you hook them up for the shortest wire length. All right, this USB cable, we don't need the data lines. So I cut them to two different lengths so that they don't accidentally short circuit each other. And I'm gonna cover them up with tape. It's kind of overkill, but I eh, might as well make sure. And actually reprinted this back piece. I gave it an indentation. That way the cable has a little bit more slop to move around also to make it easier to put the sides together. All right, I'm just gonna put an extra piece of tape over this. Actually, I'm gonna put way too much tape on it. That will act as a strain relief. All right, so it looks like we'll have plenty of room here. Oh yeah, that'll go together just fine. But always double check. This will show my young child the power of electronics. Ah, toys laying everywhere as usual. Ugh, I pick them up. Time to install the device. The device is so easy to use, even an evil empress can do it. Simply plug the USB into an available slot and then place the device anywhere in your entertainment center. Yay, it's time to watch my show again. Ah! Oh, my young ears that are so much more sensitive to high frequency sounds than adults! I mean, I could try. Oh! If only I didn't have a mean empress, Mom! Well, that was a fun project. In our next episode, we're going to do a teardown of the new PlayStation 4. I wonder what's inside. We'll find out then. The Ben Heck Show is brought to you by Element 14, the electronic design community and online store built for engineers and hobbyists alike. Join now and browse the store at element14.com. <laughs>